Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected. Good afternoon, Team Krulak community. And on behalf of Marine Corps University, the Marine Corps University Foundation, and the Brute Krulak Center for Innovation and Future Warfare, welcome back to the Brutecast, our series designed to connect the worlds of the warfighter and PME with the best in innovative and creative thought. I'm your host, Major Ian Brown, Operations Officer at the Krulak Center. Before we begin, please remember that all opinions expressed here are those of the individual and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Krulak Center, Marine Corps University, the United States Marine Corps, the Center for Naval Analyses, Georgetown University, or any other agency of the U.S. government. So we're excited to wrap up our focus on wargaming by welcoming back Team Krulak non-resident fellow Sebastian Bay to the broadcast. Sebastian is a research analyst for the, at the Center for Naval Analyses, where he works in wargaming, emerging technologies, the future of warfare, and strategy and doctrine for the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps. He also serves as an adjunct assistant professor at the Center for Security Studies at Georgetown University, where he teaches a graduate course on designing educational war games. He teaches similar courses at the Marine Corps Command and Staff College here at MCU and at the U.S. Naval Academy. Sebastian is also the faculty advisor to the Georgetown University Wargaming Society, the co-chair of the Military Operations Research Society Wargaming Community of Practice, and serves on the executive committee for the Educational Wargaming Cooperative. Previously, he served six years in the Marine Corps Infantry, deploying to Iraq in 2009 and leaving the service as a sergeant. So Sebastian's here to talk to us about how he designed the educational war game FMF Indopaycom, which went from being a COVID interest project to a tool whose use across the Marine Corps and the Joint Force, uh, Joint Force has grown exponentially in the last year and shows no signs of stopping. So Sebastian, welcome aboard and over to you. Hey, thank you, Major Brown. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back on the broadcast again, uh, especially since Fleet Marine Force has been a, a collaborative effort in many regards with the Krulak Center and the subject matter expertise that is resident down here at MCU and uh, in Quantico. So today, the briefing will mainly be a br uh, overview of how uh, what Fleet Marine Force is as an educational war game. Uh, I'll go over some of the basic uh, uh, rules components uh, to inform your questions, and then we'll tell you a little, and we'll end the discussion in terms of my presentation with what we have envisioned for the Fleet Marine Force going forward. So to look at Fleet Marine Force uh, as an overall high level view, it is a tactical educational game. And we describe as a high tactical, mainly because it does have some operational considerations as you play it. But the majority of the units are at the section or platoon level. The game was really designed to allow unit-based training and education to explore the Force Design 2030 uh, propagated by the Commandant and Expeditionary Advanced Basing Operations, or EABO. It was really a way for Marines um, from the NCO level down to the field and company grade level to really uh, explore and intellectually uh, expand their horizons when it came to future operations uh, in a multi-domain contested environment with really the Marine Littoral Regiment at the centerpiece of uh, the game. The war game really requires a few things from the players is to actively plan and coordinate in teams. The game is fundamentally structured as a team based game and to operate in multi domain and contested environments. Although our game is uh, largely tactical, we do uh, represent various domains from cyber influence, um, uh, logistics and fires uh, down to ground combat, although in various levels of uh, abstraction and uh, as, as I mentioned before, you have to consider logistical constraints. In our game, it's mainly focused on ammunition, uh, and that was a way to simplify logistical constraints. Uh, we don't consider other types of logistical constraints in terms of fuel, given the time scale, which is roughly two hours per turn. And on average, most of our games end in about seven or 10 turns. And, and the other element is to leverage and to understand the joint force and enemy capabilities, right? Uh, and this is usually done through our, uh, our card mechanic, which is what we call the joint capability cards. And we'll get into those a little bit later. As a disclaimer, the game is unclassified. Uh, it is all based on open source and unclassified research that uh, myself and my team did. And in terms of my team, we'll talk a little bit about, about that later, but that those are pretty much 
uh, colleagues of mine in the wargaming industry, but also some of my students at Georgetown University that graduated from my course. And it was really done as a pandemic, uh, you know, I mean, COVID quarantine project. When other people were baking bread and hunting for yeast, uh, we decided to create this game because this was something I wanted to do for a long time, but never really got the time to really sit down and do it. Uh, so when the Krulak Center and EWS really were looking for a game that I was uh, designing in parallel, it really provide the impetus and the deadlines required for really kick it into gear. So what are some of the learning objectives when it comes to playing FMF, either in the virtual version or in the physical copy? So in the top right hand corner, you'll see a physical version of the game during our early play tests. Uh, so you see it uses Columbia blocks, so the wooden blocks about 20 millimeters across uh, and then they are standing up. And we'll talk about some of the game mechanics a little bit later. And you see some screenshots from the cards um, that are represented by the joint capability cards that represent various capabilities from I, uh, IMD systems to ISR systems like the P8 Alpha. The game is really designed as an in-the-box commercial style educational war game. The idea is that we can hand this game to a unit and after teaching them uh, a few reps on the game that they can uh, really tailor it for their own unit specific needs and PME uh, considerations. Um, it was really designed with field and company grade officers uh, running it for their NCOs uh, in mind. So we really emphasize playability and simplicity when we we're designing the game. We wanted to have it to be multi-domain and have it to be multi-dimensional and provide really difficult tactical problems and really be also customizable for each of the uh, units and what their needs were, but at the same time provide a base rule set that was robust and flexible enough to meet those needs. In terms of learning objectives, as we were really designing the game, we had these sort of five points in mind. Was one was to enhance the Marine Corps uh, or Marine Corps officer and NCO uh, cohort and their understanding about the future force of the Marine Littor Regiment and its capabilities and missions. Uh, understanding that the tentative manual for the uh, Marine Littor Regiment and EABO only came out earlier this year in 2021 in February, um, we had to do a lot of guesswork when we were doing a lot of the open source and uh, research when it came to this. So there are some things that our Marine Littor Regiment looks a little bit different from the uh, tentative manual, but in, in a lot of regards, it's pretty uh, similar. And we could talk about the, the differences later in the Q and A. The other portion was to expand understanding of joint capabilities across all domains. One of the things we learned as we were playtesting this game was that many officers were really versed and often their warfighting function. So low station understood all the uh, the ins and outs of, of logistics uh, working for a Marine Corps unit, but didn't really understand how fires or other components work because often you have other officers trained in those shops. But one of the things we wanted to do is to help them all understand across the staff and across the shops about how all domain really works and how all of it uh, not only connects, but uh, can leverage, but also provide weaknesses and vulnerabilities in those gaps. Another portion was to improve knowledge about Chinese forces, both in the maritime and the Marine Corps element. Um, and one of the reasons we did the cards as a core mechanic was to provide a sort of uh, flashcard mechanic. So you can see a photo, there's a little blurb and flavor text of what it is and what, uh, what kind of capability it provides. And then you have the game mechanic. So it was really a way for uh, people to get uh, exposure to different capabilities, not only joint capabilities, but also adversary ones. There are both emerging capabilities that are considering, things that are on their horizon, but also things that are already in their kit right now. The other was to provide a really robust way to engage in tactical decision-making at the small unit level. So our game only looks at the regiment and below. So like I said, most of the units are at the um, section or platoon level. So you have to make these small granular details about what uh, munitions to fire, when to fire, how many salvos to fire at a tactical unit, but also how to coordinate with your tactical uh, teammates, right? Each task force is led by a different player and you can only really coordinate uh, with other players to create that joint effect, right? Another uh, and last point was to really enculturate and familiarize Marine Corps officers and NCOs with the Commandant's new Force Design 2030 vision and sort of have them engage with it. One of the things that I loved about the Marine Corps and still do is that the Marine Corps is pretty intellectually hungry and cur uh, curious and the Gazette is sort of the bastion for those kind of curiosities and we wanted to convert a lot of the articles and uh, ideas that were in the Gazette and across the force in various publications like SimSec and others into a game that we can leverage and have all of, uh, Marines of all ranks and um, specialties really engage in a powerful interactive way. So how does FMF work? 
So to understand how FMF works, we will talk a little bit about how the units are read and how the game functions as a core rule set. So on the left hand side, you'll see some of the uh, units that we have. Uh, all the units on the left hand corner is represented by a NATO symbol and its unit size. Um, underneath, they're given a fictional um, number and alphanumeric um, designation like 11 Bravo uh, or 11 Charlie representing the section and um, and the platoon that it belongs to and Charlie being its company. On the top right hand corner, you'll see a great hex. The great hex doesn't represent how many hexes it can move per se in our game because it represents mobility. Our game doesn't look at static distance, but it looks at how mobile a unit is across terrain because we wanted terrain to be a key element to our game. But we, we didn't want to make complex rules, so we color coded uh, uh, the map and the hexes by uh, degrees of five. So blue represents one, representing usually highways and main MSRs. Two represent major roads, but not particular highways, but allow uh, mobility. Three meant usually dirt roads or other small roads. And then four meant you're going over hard country. And five represent red, which was um, impassable terrain that usually, uh, and if you're saying what makes an impassable terrain, usually a whole lack of roads or the ability for a wheel vehicle like a high Mars vehicle could uh, traverse on its own. So our system is color coded. So blue is one, uh, green is two, yellow is three, orange is four, and red was representing five or impassable terrain. So for example, one one Charlie or even one one Bravo with a mobility rating of three, they can move three blue hexes, or they can move one green, one blue, or one yellow. And if you're asking, how do I go into a, uh, a four rated hex like an orange if my mobility is three, is that you can go into that hex if that's the only hex you're moving into. And you can't do any other secondary action like uh, conduct combat, uh, concealment, conduct logistics, and so forth. It's really dedicating that you are traversing hard, difficult terrain that's consuming all your time in the game um, turn. And if you look at the color coded box, uh, you, you see three primary box colors, which is green, orange, and purple. Uh, this was a way to create simple color coded, uh, color coded system for combat. So the green represents close combat, so which represents you know, what I mean, M16s, uh, you know what I mean, close action, right? Uh, orange represents long range fires. And this was the, one of the biggest abstractions because long range fires can mean a lot of different things from T-LAMPs to Naval Strike Missile to Sea Sparrow uh, to Gimlers to Prism. But we try to represent that in a single category of various capability types. Uh, and then purple represents uh, Integrated Air and Missile Defense or IAMD. And then, uh, as you see on the, the ship counter down here in the Type 55 Renhae a cruiser, or what we call a destroyer for the Chinese, is also uh, has both uh, VLS capabilities in terms of counter air uh, interceptors, but also long range strike. And lastly, you see the circles. The circles represent uh, logistics capability. And for any of our low stations out in the crowd, I apologize, you don't have any combat value. Uh, mainly because this is a 20 millimeter by 20 millimeter uh, square and we couldn't fit it anywhere. Uh, but uh, our argument is that if your low stations are on the front lines fighting combat, it is a bad day for you already. So uh, for the low stations in, in the teal, uh, light blue, baby blue circles, the two represents its total volume that can move in terms of supply. So for example, Lima Company can move two units of supply at six hexes. That exponent represents its range. And the, the second option is to move six units of supply to unit within three hexes. Uh, and that's how you're supposed to do it. And cycling back to the combat value. So if you look at 1-1 one, one Bravo, you see it's green combat value for close combat is 6-0. So 6 uh, means that it hits on a 6 and below on a D-16. So a D-16 is a 16-sided di dice. So on 1 through 6, you, you are able to score a hit. And the 0 represents you have to be co-located to uh, uh, engage in close combat. Now, if you look at 1-1 one, one Charlie, it has two orange boxes. This represents two different types of ammunitions organic to uh, the HIMARS in our in our Marine Littor Regiment, which is the A-4 represents Gimler's ER, and 10-9 represents the Naval Strike Missile via the Nemesis Launcher. So in this case, the Gimler's hits on a roughly 50% uh, PK um, uh, each, on each salvo, which is roughly four to six rockets, uh, NSM roughly being about four missiles. So Gimler's hits at eight, uh, and below and a range of four and NSM hits on 10 and below and, and a range of nine. So not knowing what uh, um, 
MRAP capability, medium range air defense capability that the Marine Corps would use. Uh, we had some uh, struggles when we were originally designing the game to figure out what uh, IAT system we would use as a proxy for the Marine Littoral Regiment. We ended up using Iron Dome because it, it had provided the most unclassified information in terms of operations, but also was able to have a, a pretty wide range. And uh, at the time when we were creating the game, the Army was considering it as part of its own uh, IMD um, acquisition process, which it has already started fielding Iron Dome. And we're not sure that if the Marine Corps would go in this direction, but this is how we did it, um, and it may change in the future. So the 4 0 represents Mattis. Uh, it's sort of uh, uh, electronic based weapon or shore rats uh, capability. Hence the four zero is less than 20 kilometers, which is the hex size. And then 11 four represents the Tamir uh, interceptor out of the iron dome system uh, at uh, intercepting at 11 and below and at the range of four. If you're wondering why the Type 55, uh, in terms of long range strike, has infinite range, it's because its range uh, it actually exceeds the, uh, the scope of our map. So we pretty much put it as infinite instead of putting a 35 or 45 um, on on the block, which proved problematic at times. Also, at the same time, because we use Columbia blocks, we were able to use imperfect information. So we included decoys, uh, both ground and naval. Uh, and this represents you know, abstractly the ability to spoof, but also have physical decoys like bouncy houses that represent high Mars and camouflage and other signal spoofing uh, on the uh, EMS. So these are represented by these counters on the top uh, right uh, center uh, of the counter. And then the task force counters allow uh, players to aggregate large collections of units into a single counter um, off the side of the board. So how does the turn structure work for FMF? It's pretty much broken into four major stages, which is planning, deployment, initiative check, uh, or action, then initiative check. And the planning stage is really when you get your scenario brief, which is often in the form of a five paragraph order or, or a truncated version of that, which gives a general situation reflective of the old Crickspiel style, which is uh, a simple story, usually a paragraph or two long, uh, giving the strategic or operational context and sort of the tactical goals. And then the next portion of that uh, planning element or planning document is often an order of battle and giving out goal objectives, whether it's to break out of a certain island chain like he does in the Luzon uh, Pass scenario or to eliminate certain ge or to see certain geographic airports or um, or naval ports. And it also often has turn limits and will uh, give out command points. So what are command points? In FMF, command points are large abstractions of your ability as a regiment or the force that you represent to ask for joint or adjacent uh, support, whether that be physical equipment or asking for missions uh, like combat air patrol. So the command points allow uh, us as designers and as facilitators to produce uh, constraints onto the planning. So, for example, for a smaller scenario, often of two versus two, we often have roughly 15 to 20 points that forces hard choices of what capabilities and uh, you are bringing to the fight. For larger regimental battles, we often have roughly 40 to 50 command points in the first initial stage and so forth. Uh, and the schedule of command points is, allows you to potentially get more throughout the game on let's say turns three and turn five in the lose on pass scenario. So in the planning stage, you and your teammates, let's say me and Major Brown uh, are, are representing the USMC team, we must have to come up with our tactical concept, right? How, what is our plan to defeat uh, or defend a certain uh, territory or execute a certain mission? And what are the capabilities in the joint capability deck that we need to do that mission? And how do we you know, in, uh, balance the trade-offs between certain capabilities in terms of the command point al allocations? For instance, a P8 is uh, often a, a more expensive card uh, than, let's say, a class three VBAT, right? Which is usually a one, right? Um, and often if you have um, high-end uh, platforms like satellites and other things, it eats into your command points. Like satellites are five, right? FAD is five. So you have to think about what are your risks and where are you taking it? And often if it is purposeful in the sense that we force our players to uh, balance different domains and where you're going to take risks. For example, am I going to go heavy on cyber and attack their networks? Uh, so they, I reduce their uh, kinetic effectiveness in terms of fires and interception. Or am I going a more traditional maneuver and fire uh, uh, approach? And those are all decisions and discussions that are really fruitful. Uh, and the next portion is deployment. Uh, often, like you see in the graphic, you're given a zone that you're able to deploy to. Uh, and this is often done uh, behind screens. Uh, in the virtual one, uh, we, we do it um, where we... Some, 
I usually deploy them uh, just to save on time. But usually when we do it in person, when we have enough time, we have them deploy uh, their forces to uh, reflect their tactical plan. And last state, uh, the next portion is actions, is where the majority of our game is played. Um, this represents where you get to do your action points, which is really think of them as orders. So typically a, a task force commander controlling about five or eight units, um, they have three uh, action points or orders to give out. Uh, and we'll talk about the different orders they can give and each team alternates. So for example, in the Luzon pass scenario, the Chinese team has the initiative. So a Chinese player will go first, let's say task force Beijing. And then the second player in that, uh, in that turn will be a blue player, let's say task force bears, and it'll alternate until all the players have gone. And this allows us to represent simultaneous time in sort of an impulse way uh, and allows sort of small nuance uh, of reactions within a turn, right? And the next portion is a quick check if anyone has shifted initiative. It was just often done by destroying the most units in a singular turn. Um, and But that can also be changed depending on the scenario and also checking if anyone has satisfied victory. If victory hasn't been checked or achieved or initiative has changed, you go straight back to actions unless you get uh, new command points on uh, uh, certain specific turns as specified in your scenario. So what are the different types of actions you can do in our game? Uh, for simplicity, we really wanted to boil it down uh, to four things. Uh, with this said, our, our game uh, um, at Fleet Marine Force is really about completing the sensor to shooter web right, or chain. How do I see a target? How do I prosecute, uh, prosecute targets? How do I coordinate with my uh, adjacent forces uh, to uh, continually engage and maintain awareness of targets? How do I defend myself using either cyber or uh, signal management or deception or even IADs, right? So with that in mind, uh, we have four major uh, actions you can do, what we call core actions. Uh, and you'll see that there's an important note uh, that says and or or. Uh, so each core action has two steps into it, uh, and you're able to do either both or just a single portion of it. For example, you can move and combat. Uh, for example, you can move a high Mars unit, let's say three blue hexes, and then engage in a long range strike using Gimlers against, let's say, you're in Chinese uh, BMPs uh, uh, in the open. Or uh, you can uh, move three hexes and as an infantry unit, engage in close combat. That's all with a single core action. Um, or you can move and conceal. So in our game, we only allow you to engage with uh, revealed units to sort of represent sort of taxit one data that you sort of know where they are in a relative area representing uh, the 20 kilometer hex uh, range but you don't know that precise location. So we wanted uh, our players to really uh, do the ISR battle. Uh, in the contest. So either through cyber means, through EMS means, through uh, intelligence means, through uh, typical ISR means, drones, PAs, and so forth, right? So, but let's say you are revealed by a, a PA and you don't want to be revealed for the next turn. On your turn, you can tell your unit to move and conceal itself, right? Representing it's actively trying to avoid uh, uh, detection again by enemy capabilities. And then you have joint capability cards that are really range the gamut. Uh, there are four real major types of joint capability cards, uh, which is a single use, like a, let's say a tactical cyber attack, uh, a persistent one, for example, like support from the MIG, uh, which will allow you to use effect every turn uh, uh, moving forward. Uh, you have nullifying cards that often negate other joint capability cards. This is often you know, in the cyber realm. For example, someone uses a, a tactical cyber attack, and then I have a tactical cyber defense that will nullify it if I roll what is required of the card. And then the other portion is um, attachments. These represent things like prism, as you see on the slide, or physical equipment or units that are attached to units, whether that be unmanned boats, VBATs, or prisms, or other types of munitions and equipment. Uh, and this uh, uh, mechanic of using various cards in our decks, each team has roughly 111 cards uh, and we're building more cards as we uh, as we are uh, continuing to build on the game. So imagine like we have over 240 cards in our uh, in our deck that include various uh, capabilities uh, allows our players to have a vast. Um, a vast decision space when it comes to what kind of plans they can do and also what kind of scenarios you can play. We have everything from influence operations and like things like combat camera all the way up to humanitarian uh, response or even THAAD, right? 
And before anyone asks, there's no tactical nukes. They always, that's always a question I get. I don't know why, but it always comes up. Um, and then we have our last action, which is move and conduct resupply. So if you think back to Lima company, this is the action that only they can do, other logistic companies. Um, them and other FARP units, um, they're able to either uh, move or conduct resupply other units. Um, uh, one last thing that I would like to talk about is one of the cool mechanics that I really love in our uh, in the game is what we call uh, the C5 ISR card. Uh, it's not represented, but uh, it's a, a joint capability card that is required for all teams to play. For the Chinese, we call it Battlefield AI. For the uh, US side, we call it ABMS after the Air Force Program of Record, um, Advanced Battle Management System that they're really trying to look for to sort of connect uh, everything uh, through the uh, tactical network. So this represents all the various future, but also current capabilities like AFATIS, Link 16, Blue Force Tracker. Uh, and we wanted it to be uh, a part of the game so you don't see that your, your effectiveness as a, a unit is, uh, is uh, an island of excellence by itself uh, on the battlefield, but that it is uh, contingent on able to share and uh, uh, collect information from across the force, right? So for example, as uh, let's say a Chinese team does tactical cyber attacks and is successful, they put uh, degradation counter or cubes on ABMS, your um, your network. And as you collect more degradation, your PKs, right, reduce. For example, if you have two or three cubes on ABMS, your PKs, your combat values um, are reduced by two. So that eight, four for Gimblers becomes a six, four now. Now, let's say if you have four or more, more cubes and you're really degraded in, in a contested environment, that eight is reduced by five. So that becomes a three. So your ability to process targets in a really precise way is reduced and you have to sort of fight that cyber battle, right? So what is the current status of the game? At, at the moment, um, the game is still uh, being you know, sort of honed, but it largely is about 99% done, and we're sending out physical sets out to the fleet. Uh, this includes various people like 10th Marines, 11th Mew, uh, 15th Mew, 22nd Mew, and other places. Uh, and they're really, um, it has been really rewarding to send out these sets, and I'll have a picture of it later. But we also have a picture from EWS from earlier this year when we ran with the Krulak Center 16 simultaneous uh, sessions. Uh, of FMF for all 16 conferences uh, and over two days. And it was really fruitful because we got through four or even sometimes six uh, repetitions of uh, the scenario. And it was really powerful as designers to see uh, the students engaging with it in, a, uh, in various ways and using their knowledge and tools that they learned during EWS uh, to implement various plans and also adapt to each other. Um, uh, the game also has a base rule, which mainly I talked about today, but we also have an advanced rule set that we've been playing with, uh, mainly because we wanted the game to be simple and easy to learn and accessible, right? But at the same time, uh, unavoidably, you have uh, Marines blowing up my email and saying, hey, why didn't you include this? Or did you include this portion? Or what about this? Or this nuance, right? Um, and I always want to say, yeah, that's a great idea. I would love to put in the base rules. But then what happens is you have mission creep, right? And then the base rule no longer becomes accessible. So one of the ways to fix this is that we created a sort of a la carte advanced rules. It's not a comprehensive rule set that you can essentially play on its own, but are, they're essentially a list of different mechanics that you can add into the base rules. Like, for example, we have a whole section on IAD rules that make the IAD rules more nuanced, right? For example, of let's say uh, we don't, uh, so in, one of the abstractions in the game is that we allow crossing shots or crossing inter uh, interceptions, which is pretty unlikely in the real world, right? But for simplicity, uh, for simplicity and accessibility, we allow that. But in the advanced rules, we make explicit rules that says, hey, you must be up threat or have in, uh, overflight interception uh, for you to be able to intercept an uh, uh, attack by the enemy against a defended target. And those are some uh, examples. We also include uh, more advanced logistics rules and other uh, uh, ground combat rules and so forth. All right. right now, we're currently producing 50 physical copies, uh, literally on my dining room table for various schoolhouses, uh, both in the Marine Corps um, and also units out in the fleet. Uh, and we're also sending them to some of our uh, joint partners, like in the uh, headquarters, Air Force and others. Um, we're also 
conduct these vir virtual sessions via tabletop simulator. We have a virtual version of the game. We usually run about one or three virtual sessions a week, uh, often in uh, partnership with people who are getting uh, physical copies. So think of them as train the trainer sessions. So we leave them and facilitate them through a game and they're able to play with us and ask questions of what does this represent? How do you do this? And they get a gist of being able to see us facilitate a game. Usually they're run by myself or one of the members of the design team. At this point, I would really love to thank all, all the various subject matter experts and support that we gotten from various institutions, including MCU and the Krulak Center uh, and various units in the fleet. Like 10th Marines was one of our first early play testers uh, and really advocates for, uh, for, this, um, for this system. Um, as a reminder, this is a, a personal uh, project and is not owned by the Marine Corps or the Krulak Center or any other government agency. So uh, I would like to end with one last slide showing pictures of what we're doing currently into the future, and then I'll take questions and answers. So on the left-hand side, you'll see three uh, complete sets of what uh, FMSF looks like. So you see the blue blocks and all the uh, pieces. And yes, you'll see little submarine pieces uh, right above the cards uh, in one of the pieces. And you see little drones uh, and you see the cards that are printed uh, professionally for us to send out to units. Uh, currently, we have sent out roughly 20. I sent out two more yesterday uh, to various units that include TBS, uh, a third Mardiv, third uh, MLG, and so forth. Um, and actually, I was telling Major Brown today that we just got uh, some feedback from the fleet about, hey, uh, that was essentially uh, one of the officers who was running it, laid it all out and was you know, sort of teaching himself how to do it as he's facilitating a game uh, tomorrow. But he got more interest and curiosity about the uh, Force Design 2030 and EABO in the uh, in the in this past 24 hours uh, in his email, and, he's, and he wanted us to know that it was really a way for their unit to really engage with these kind of concepts in a tangible, meaningful way. And the picture actually comes from what, last week, Major Brown, uh, when he was running our new uh, UCOM expansion, which includes a Russian order of battle and Russian joint capability cards. Uh, and we're working on allied uh, forces like the, like the Norwegians and the British and the Japanese uh, and the Australians in our, in our future sets. But the Russian order of battle and the Russian expansion into the Yukon theater, which included Norway, the Black Sea, Crimea, and, um, and the Eastern Mediterranean right now that we're working on. And as you see, the Norway map is massive. It is four normal uh, uh, FMF maps put together. Uh, and I would love to thank... Um, Mackenzie Kramer, who is an undergraduate student at uh, Oregon State University, who designed these maps on uh, ArcGIS for us, which he has been absolutely a, a treasure, uh, honestly, and he's been doing great work for us. But at this point, I would love to take some questions and answers. All right, great. Thank you very much, Sebastian. And uh, I'll turn it out to the audience. Go ahead and, and if you have a question, go ahead and start throwing it into the chat. And I've got a couple here um, that I'm going to get to off the bat. And uh, my I'm going to go in slightly reverse order for how I receive them, but I promise I'll get to them all. Um, so first, first one is kind of a two part question from uh, Jim Roach, who actually uh, good to see you, sir. We had had him on the broadcast a little while ago to talk about uh, amphibious aircraft and seaplanes, and that was a great talk. So um, it, questions are one, if whether there's any variability for uh, things like you know different types of weather, and I'll throw in um, you know different types of weather, climatology, things like that. And then two, and I will, I'll be a little presumptive here and answer a little bit, and then I'll throw it to you, Sebastian. But the second part is, can players create their own scenarios? Uh, and then a little bit more about the, sort of the process of creating your own maps, and, and maybe you could talk to that. But to that, to that second part, I'll say, Jim, um, yes, you can create your own scenarios. And in fact, I'm, I think we would all collectively love it for people to do that because uh, it's actually a lot of work. <laughs> Um, even just a simple two page scenario. And I'll, I'll tie back to that Norway map, for example. Um, I made a scenario for that one specifically because we were doing that event with the Marine Corps advisory company and wanted to get them something in UCOM. And we had this beautiful new Norway map. So I said, I would create a scenario. And um, it, for a small number of actual pieces on there, uh, it, it's, it's really hard. And, uh, but, but I think the, the, the beauty of it is that the system is flexible enough that you can create your own if uh, if you understand the mechanics. So I guess with that, Sebastian, I'd ask you, what are some other examples of sort of homegrown scenarios that people have made? Um, how could people submit scenarios if they have things they've created that they would like to share with the community? And then I'll, uh, I'll leave it to you for the climatology and, uh, and weather and things like that as well. 
So to answer the climate question first, because uh, is the easiest is, uh, yes, there is weather and different sea states and, uh, and portions to element to it, but largely a lot of that is baked into the scenario. It's not baked into the rule set itself. For example, if you see, uh, I'll go back to the slide, you see the Norway map, you see that white sort of uh, area around the board, those represent ice cap areas that uh, our map maker, uh, Matt Kramer, sort of uh, already designed into the map. But in the scenario, for example, a major brown scenario, he says, ignore those. Those th there are, did you ignore those or did you have those in icebreakers? I don't remember. For this one, I, I ignore them. I have a, a dream to include them in a future one, but not for the first one, no. Yeah, so exam that's a perfect example. So like depending on the weather or the time period or the, your, even your own TLOs that you want to get, you can say, hey, ignore those ice uh, ice hexes, they don't exist. Or you can say, hey, those ice hexes exist and we're going to add some more, right, for whatever reason, right? Um, there are also scenarios where we um, uh, there's a system where you can inject as a facilitator event cards. Uh, for example, you can say, hey, there's a landslide covering these hexes. These are now impassable, right? Or you can say, hey, there's a sea state and all naval movement is now reduced by two, right, um, or and so forth, right? Uh, so there's an easy way to do that, and that's often through the scenario. The system is designed for, to, for it to be flexible and really uh, abil uh, its ability to adapt to your needs as, uh, uh, as an instructor, but also as a facilitator. Uh, the second portion is to how do I write scenarios? So often you write scenarios by basing uh, uh, your own experience, but also uh, through experiences of playing the game. So one of the great advantages of running so many virtual sessions in the past year or so. Uh, so since uh, since January-ish, uh, we run over 200 virtual sessions uh, and that has created a cadre of people, uh, both in the Marine Corps and other places that are able to write scenarios for us. And I have a couple of people working on scenarios using their very expertise. And often they send them to me, I, I give them my feedback and we often will add them to uh, the scenario booklet that I uh, maintain on a Google Drive for the various units who have physical copies. Um, and it can range. The scenarios can be as flexible, as wide as you want. Like for example, um, we had an office, uh, office on Quantico that was really looking at um, non-kinetic, uh, non-lethal capabilities. And they, they were like, hey, we have these, uh, these things and we'd love it to include your game. And we created a scenario just for them, which is about humanitarian response and not engaging with kinetic fires, but using these capabilities, moving people out of the way and sort of like gray zone-esque uh, operations. Uh, so if that answers your question. Great, thanks. All right, so I'll go. Um... Next one we had from uh, Dr. Leslie Wilhelm, who's been another great friend of the Crelac Center, actually um, asking when and where herself or others in the audience might be able to watch uh, a game being played. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm going to assume that the digital version is probably the the next one on the on the pipeline. Yeah, so depending where you are, so I live in uh, Northern Virginia. So if you're in, nor in the Northern Virginia, DC area, uh, shoot me email and we can run a uh, 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 in-person game COVID uh, precautions um, allowing. Um, but there's a virtual session tonight, actually, that uh, Mike Bond will be running today for a bunch of different officers and analysts from all over, really. Uh, and then we're running another one on Saturday, I think maybe on Sunday, and then another three the following week. Uh, so it's a pretty busy schedule, so just let me know, and we'll, we'll let you jump on to Discord, and some, uh, one of us will share our screen and let you see and hear the gameplay. And I personally love, even when I'm not running a session, I usually come for the very beginning when they have their first planning session, and they start talking about what their tactical concept is. It's one of my favorite parts. And then I pop in at the very end to hear about their hot watch, what they learned, what they hated about the game, what they loved about the game. Um, and it's always really useful and fruitful. And it all gives me great ideas for next uh, for the next scenarios that we want to work on. Awesome. Thanks. All right. So uh, going through here, next question was uh, from Albert Lee, uh, kind of tying into the Norway, the larger Norway map. He's asking if they're how many Pacific maps there are in the current incarnation of the game and whether there's anything to the same scale as the Norway map. I, I kind of know the answer, but I'll let you. Uh, yeah. Um, so that. there are a couple of different maps that we had. Uh, uh, our two main map producers were MCIA, who we cannot thank enough for their support in terms of making the early maps. Uh, they created the Singapore map, uh, the Straits of Malacca map, uh, Strait, Singapore and Straits of Malacca map. Um, a southern Vietnam map, uh, a northern Luzon map, which you guys see on the table. Um, and then uh, Kramer created uh, Taiwan um, and then 
two reuse maps, which is similar to uh, the Norway maps. So the Riku is covering a vast area of ocean and land. Um, we had, we built east and west, which are designed to be uh, put together next to each other, like the Norway map. So they're, they're half the size of the Norway maps uh, in terms of there are only two normal maps put together, but it is still pretty big. Um, in terms of maps we're working on right now, you see the Norway map that we just finished up. We're working on a Crimea Black Sea map. Uh, and then uh, Eastern um, Med one, and then Danish Straits ones are our are, are next maps. And then other ones that we want to work on there back in the queue is uh, Sri Lanka or somewhere in the Indian Ocean, um, and potentially uh, like uh, Timor Leste and other areas that we are, are looking at. But if you have ideas, let me know. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add on to that saying that there's, there's sort of a couple of production uh, mechanisms for the maps here, but um, for those in the audience who are uh, with a Marine Corps unit and have a sort of a formal request for an area of interest, you can absolutely let us let myself know. And we, as Sebastian has on the slide there, working with Marine Corps intelligence activity, they produce the first slate of maps. And I'm still we're, we're still fielding requests from units asking for maps for uh, specific areas. So in addition to the one Sebastian's mentioned, I've already got requests up to MCIA for some other parts of UCOM looking at parts of the Northwest Passage and then looking at parts of Southcom as well. So um, there, there, there are different ways to get after an area uh, if there's something you're specifically interested in. Okay, um, probably a question a lot of folks have next from Andy Roberts is, what's it cost to make a set um, and how is that covered? <laughs> uh, so that's a good question. So on the virtual version, the cheapest option is just to play on tabletop simulator. We're actually, uh, so in tabletop simulator, if you are, um, digitally, uh, literate, you can go on steam and then get it on tabletop simulator, which costs about $20. It's a platform. The game itself is free, but getting the platform costs money. Uh, and you can join us for our virtual sessions. Uh, that's probably the easiest and most expedient way. It is not searchable on its own. I have to add you. So you have to tell me that you want to be part of these sessions and I add you to the, the access list to get the module. Uh, after you have tabletop simulator. So that's the easiest way. Uh, for a physical copy, uh, we put a, a call out for uh, request for physical copies earlier um, in the fall. And we have 50 or so requests that we are doing our first batch. Um, and then we, are, we have a wait list right now that we're collecting names or, or people who are interested or potentially interested in getting copies, which is roughly about 35, I think, last, uh, last time I checked, uh, which will hopefully kick off in the winter uh, as we finish up the first batch. Um, in terms of the cost, um, we ask our units, uh, ask the units or individuals who are getting them to cover the, the material cost, which is roughly about $200. Uh, the reason it's so high is because uh, the blocks themselves are pretty expensive, the cards themselves are for printing is expensive and we are assembling these um, uh, uh, by hand and we don't we don't buy them in bulk so we have to buy them as we, we get requests so that costs some of the prof, uh, problems and costs and we ask you to cover the shipping to wherever you are normally it's not a big deal in terms of shipping unless you like or overseas in like germany or okinawa that can cause problems but um that's how we're doing it right now uh but at make it very clear like we're not profiting off of it we just literally have you cover the cost of the actual materials that we're buying to build the sets so you know i mean you don't ask you to cover our time or anything so we do we do this as a volunteer thing all right thanks all right another question from albert lee uh asking on behalf of an acquaintance do you personally uh play any other commercial type war games uh such as as war game red dragon in your spare time or has it become too much like work to be enjoyable oh friend i play war games any chance i get i play frederick whenever ian brown like doesn't want to you know what i mean uh you know I mean? when he feels up to it because it, yeah i'm undefeated against him uh but we all i also play uh war game red dragon and other games uh, uh, I play ICBM recently by Matrix Games with some colleagues. Um, I'm really into manual games and uh, and COVID sort of easing up uh, or easing uh, ramping back up, depending on where you are in the country, has really allowed us to get back on the table. But also I've been playing a lot of games uh, virtually with friends like Root uh, and other things. But yeah, I play lots of commercial games. Um, it's never like too much like work. Uh, I like to think of it the other way around that work is like play, uh, which I like to have a more, uh, positive attitude, but at times uh, it can be draining um, and takes a lot of time. But uh, the way I see it, commercial games are a way for us 
uh, as professional war game designers to stay attuned and abreast of all the different developments uh, happening in terms of mechanics, ideas, and concepts that we can potentially apply in our uh, day job for DoD. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I'll, I'll put a plug in for one of Sebastian's side jobs here with the Georgetown University Wargaming Society, where uh, you know they, they do run in person commercial games on the weekends just for fun. Um, and I was I was very happy to come a couple weekends ago and take one of my own family's passion projects, which is the Star Wars series of games of X Wing and Armada. And uh, yeah, it's it's really nerdy, but when you boil it down, it's really it's fleet tactics, it's ship on ship tactics, and um, it was a uh, it was. It was a good time had by all. So we still do these things for fun. All right. Um, next question from, I'm sorry, giving a lot of questions, folks. So I'm, I'm just going to ask these um, myself to make sure we get to all of them in the time we have is um, has CDET requested copies of your game um, from, and it's from Andy Roberts. And he's saying he would love to run one with his CDET EWS class. Um, I believe we have someone from CDET. Wasn't that Dave Soner? I forget who, but there was someone from CDAT that one time that came over to the Krillax Center that asked about it. Um, Sebastian, this is Dave Sonier. I, I came over from CDAT. Um, I don't know if Mr. Roberts is asking for the virtual um, or the uh, board game um, there, but uh, myself and uh, Captain uh, uh, Jamal Campbell would certainly don't need to be in areas, but we'll do anything uh, we can to help uh, get you uh, what you need from the, the Krillax Center. Over. There you go. There's your answer. All right. Um, yeah, and I'll say a, a, acting as a sort of a, a linkage point at the Krillax Center is, is something we're happy to do, and we look at it as part of our job. Um, so please send those requests our way. All right, next from um, Fizalji Odedra. Um, I think we've seen you before as well. Thanks for coming back to the broadcast. Asking, has the game received any interest from commercial war game distributors? It has, and we're working with um, some trying to get a commercial version of it um, because that would alleviate a lot of my stress and also be really cool to publish uh, uh, this game for the commercial market. But it is also a long process. So uh, for the near future, I still see myself uh, cutting these up uh, by hand and uh, you know, stickering them. So I may enlist uh, Major Brown's kids one day and be like, hey, I will you know, pay for your labor and pizza, uh, and then we shall have arts and crafts day. Uh, but right now, at the moment, uh, we are still we're working with some commercial developers, but that's still a long timeline. Great, and and uh, there's actually a follow up question from the same person here, and I'm I'm gonna give Tim Barrick out there a warning order that you might want to weigh in on this as well. Uh, the question is is in the future, is there a scope for FMF? Um, that could bring in elements of the Marine Corps operational war game system. And as it happens, we have uh, Colonel Tim Barrick now, uh, I guess Mr. Tim Barrick retired from the Marine Corps just recently, but who just came on board the Kulak Center as the war gaming director at MCU and who is uh, um, deeply, deeply um, uh, knowledge of the Marine Corps operational war game system. So um, sir and Sebastian, I'm, I'm happy to let either of you weigh in on that future possibility. Yeah, so um, not speaking for Tim, but he, he and I, after he played my game, I've played his game for my students as well. Uh, we we see a lot of um, overlap also, and also like in complementary natures, right? Uh, my game is super tactical. I always say like um, Tim's game, like one hex is my whole map, <laughs> right? Uh, and the scale is pretty different. But also at the same time, you can you can look at it in the sense that like for example, you can play uh, one level, the operational level can play uh, OWS on a single map, and then you can have a bunch of tactical maps, right? Uh, breaking down those tactical uh, uh, engagements uh, as well. But you know, I mean, uh, OWS also has those tactical maps that are, are being built into it as well at different scales. Uh, but so it really depends on what you are trying to do. And I'll hand it over to Tim if you have any more comments. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Yeah, so just a, a quick distinction between the, the operational war game system with Assassin's Mace and the Zopit expansion that's coming out. You know, the, the unit counters in the operational war game system, uh, right now at the smallest level or at the battalion level, in FMF uh, that Sebastian has de developed, you know, the unit counters are at the platoon level. So if you're looking at a, you know, nuanced tactical maneuver uh, inside the battalion, 
then you're looking at uh, the the FMF gain is really the optimal solution. So inside a, a infantry battalion, for example, doing uh, war gaming events at the platoon company level, I think the FMF into PACOM gain is is really the right game in that in that tactical fight. Uh, the operational war game system, because it's it's battalion level uh, and above, you're really looking at the, the bigger picture kind of battle. And and you know the joint task force level at the high MAC path level kind of campaign um, and across a theater and you're looking at being able to replicate the, the bigger picture. Uh, so that's the key distinction between the two games. I think they're complementary. You know the the rule systems are different, uh, but they're both uh, relatively easy uh, to learn. And so I think they're complementary. I think they're both. Uh, games that units would be interested in, and it really depends on the scenario that they're trying to play and what they're trying to replicate uh, in that scenario is term in terms of which one is the more appropriate game system. All right, thank you very much, sir. And uh, I'll throw in another uh, a, a plug for our, our war gaming director now as well. Um, you know, for we, we've now got the mastermind behind Assassin's Maze. So if there's, you know, additional questions down the road from folks in the audience, please feel free to send them our way because we've 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 got the person who can answer them the best. All right. Uh, a couple more questions here from Albert Lee asking, uh, first, do you think uh, if the game, if FMF does get commercialized, is that going to affect what you're doing on tabletop simulator in terms of the accessibility uh, as well? He's asking about uh, Discord server for FMF sessions, whether that's something that is open access or if that's something like the TTS where you have to be invited or to be part of a Marine group to get in there. So uh, for the Discord channel, I actually just use the Goose Discord channel. So if you're part of the Georgetown University War Game Society, which is also public, right? So you don't have to be a Georgetown student to join our Discord. You can come and join and that's the Discord that we use uh, for uh, FMF sessions. Um, in terms of accessibility, even with, let's say, best case scenario, we find a commercial uh, publisher that is able to uh, publish it in the future. Uh, we still want the TTS out there and, and the Basel module out there, and which is not uncommon for commercial games to have. Um, so like, for example, Nevsky, which is a, uh, a commercial game, has a Basel module out for free, which we're designing right now. Hopefully we'll get it out in the next month or so, uh, because I know TTS has been causing some issues in terms of the graphic cards and uh, and the requirements in terms of hardware. So we're trying to create uh, leverage Vassal, which is a much easier um, version of a virtual gameplay to uh, use uh, for the fleet. Great, thank you. Um, coming up on an hour here, and I've run out of questions on the chat. So uh, Sebastian, I'm happy to give you some, some final comments and thoughts about, um, I, I guess maybe one last question I had uh, before we get to the end is, what are some of the, uh, you know, we, we've got pictures of different services around the table um, in you know, the insights of having versus a, a Marine Corps audience that you've seen in the different iterations of the game. Oh, yeah, that's uh, that's a great question. So uh, I have facilitated and sat on many uh, virtual sessions and many uh, in-person sessions. And it's always interesting to see how players tackle a problem. Um, especially with our tutorial session, which we force all the players, the first time players to play for the first time as a, like a scenario on training wheels. Uh, and it's always interesting because you'll see in the first time they play, they have uh, their own organizational biases and their biases of their experience. Like, for example, like when we played with a bunch of Air Force officers, they're all like Air Force, like B2s, you know, uh, B21s and so forth, and like hypersonic missiles and stuff, right? And they're like, well, we don't understand this naval stuff, so we'll just come with air power, right? Um, and then you have the Marine Corps guys, and they'll, they'll be um, sort of pigeonholed in their own sort of perspective on where their staff experience was and so forth. Uh, um, and it was interesting, but it's also super interesting when you have joint teams and you have an army officer, you have an air force officer, you have an analyst from let's say RAN or CSBA uh, on a team and they're able to provide their different perspectives and experiences of saying, hey, I understand this capability. Let me give you what I think we should do. Or I played this before and this is what happened. Uh, so maybe we should consider this risk in terms of cyber or other things, right? Um, and it's really fantastic to see that kind of knowledge transfer, not only from the game to the players, but the players between each other and how their experiences are informed. Uh, I'll tell you a really uh, funny story, really. One time, 
Um, so in the normal Luzon scenario, where it's a two versus two, the U.S. Marine Corps side doesn't have a THAAD or a ballistic missile defense system, and you're on Luzon well within the WES of the DF-21 and 26. Um, and an Army officer uh, was saying, like, hey, you're like, we should get THAAD. It's a five points out of 15. I know it's a lot, but we should get it. It's really problematic, right? Um, and the other two Marine Corps officers were like, no, no, we don't need that. It's okay. Like, let's do these other sort of high-end, like, munitions and such uh, for, like, kinetic strikes and stuff and ISR. In turn one, uh, the Chinese player who, uh, team that has played it once, they revealed the, uh, the sole logistics company, dropped the DF on it, like, tremendous amount of fire on it, destroyed the logistics company. And you can see you can see on the face on the video of the army officer, he's like, I told you so. And he was so angry. And the hot wash, uh, one of the Marine Corps officers like, oh, yeah, we should have listened to him. He was so right on this. But this is not to say this happens all the time, right? It just happened this one time, right? Um, and it's something is about how you see the threat, how you see the problem can be really informative for other players on your team, but also from the other team and how they see problems. Because you know, the red team you played last time won't play it the same way as the red team you're going to face tomorrow, right? And it's really fascinating to see that kind of uh, variability in a, even a single scenario. Yeah, that's definitely one of my favorite stories from the game as well. There, there's been a common theme that seems to creep up in other games that uh, if you don't pay attention to Naval Minds, Naval Minds will pay attention to you. So <laughs> who, who doesn't mind? Yeah, uh, and... and uh, and so on that note, one thing I would like to say is that one of the reasons we use different maps and also different scenarios is to provide different tactical problems, right? Like um, the sea denial, sea, uh, sea control mission of the Luzon Pass scenario in, uh, in the Philippines is much different from like even a very similar mission uh, set in the Singapore Straits uh, or the Straits of Malacca near Singapore, right? The geography is much different. We include submarines into that game, uh, which complicate all sorts of problems, right? So not only do you have to worry about cruise missions, missiles and anti-ship missiles. You have to worry about submarines now and laying out sono buoys and so forth. Uh, and it's really fascinating to to, uh, to look at those kind of problems. But then you look at, let's say, um, the Rikus, right? Uh, it's about range and volume. And, and sometimes volume is what you need. Sometimes it is about range. Sometimes it is about uh, having uh, um, a diverse set of ISRs, and sometimes it's just worrying about a single dimension, right? So it really depends on the context. And that's why I really want to drive home with, with educational wargaming is that, one, there's no uh, one singular game that fits all needs, right? Like we talked about with uh, Tim's game with Assassin's Masons of Pod and my own game with FMF is that it, we need as a service uh, an ecosystem of games. And this is something I've always harped on, uh, harped on, and it's one of my soapbox issues is that we need games for all ranks and services and needs, right? And sometimes uh, FMF will fit that need and other times a pod or Assassin's Mace will do it. And we need others to fill in that ecosystem. Uh, and this is something we have done in the past that uh, uh, Ian and I have written about in, in our uh, recent Jams uh, article about educational wargaming uh, in the service. But the second thing is that War games don't provide uh, educational war games don't provide definitive answers of how the future war will be fought, how this war will go, or and so forth. Right? It's really about context-based decision making and insights. Right? So in this context, when red or blue did this, this is what happened. Right? And then, but what if we change this? Like for example, when we talked about um, ha uh, the U.S. Marine Corps not having any uh, BMD and having that, right? Uh, what if there is a, a surface action group there with Aegis and that provides BMD for the force? How does that change uh, the equation uh, for ISR, for RED, or other capabilities, right? Do they still go after the same uh, sort of strategy? Probably not, right? Because the, their presence changes the calculus of that context, right? So it's really about, like we said, going back to the original purpose of the game was to provide an intellectual sandbox for our units to morph, change, add, um, and one of the reasons we use cards as the core mechanic was because it's easy to do, uh, to add new cards, to change new cards. Uh, I was just telling a unit right now that they're like, hey, uh, what about this? Or can we change this? I'm like, do whatever you want with these games, right? Like, it is yours. You can tailor it to whatever you need at your unit and, and your training le learning objectives. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I'll, uh, I'll, I'll make my last comment about the Norway scenario and then we'll wrap it up. But for uh, for the Norway thing again, as Sebastian kind of said, um, kind of felt the need that it'd be it'd be interesting to have a dynamic where Norwegian conventional forces would be the only ones allowed to do certain things on Norwegian territory. So we just we just made some. So there are there are green blocks alongside the blue and the red blocks, and that's okay because the game is is designed to let you do that stuff. Um, 
Okay, great. We're at exactly an hour, so uh, I'm going to wrap things up here. Sebastian, thank you very much uh, for your time. I know you're a very busy guy, but it's good to have you back on the Brewcast. And you know we'll be seeing you around the Kulak Center spaces here. Um, actually, we've seen you on Monday because we're doing this yeah. over at the basic school, um, uh, running running four different uh, simultaneous versions. So uh, there's no rest for Sebastian and the FMF team. For everyone else in the audience, thanks for joining us today. Next week, uh, we're proud to offer another collaborative presentation with our Middle East Studies office in line with their series of research talks this year. Uh, the next one going uh, this Thursday afternoon is going to be with Ms. Yun Sun, who is the China Program Director and East Asia Program Co-Director at the Stimson Center, where she'll be talking about China's Afghanistan strategy post-U.S. withdrawal. We'll see you all then. Thank you. Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected.